So, without further ado, I just want everyone to give a warm welcome to Keith. Thank you very much. So, um, just to continue the introduction, um, my name's Keith Williams. I'm the development manager at Sun Branding Solutions. For those of you who don't know who we are, we're based over in Bradford. Uh, marketing get very grumpy if I don't put this slide in. Um, we're basically, we work with the packaging industry. We've been around for well over 100 years. Um, specifically in digital, we produce enterprise software that basically lets our customers get their packaging and that, by that logic, their products onto the shelf quicker. And I think about, at last count, about eight out of 10 of the products that you put in a typical shopping basket have been through us in some way, shape or form um, at some point in their lives. Uh, which I didn't know before I started. We're kind of one of those companies that you never hear of, but we do quite a bit in the background. And so some of the people we work with, Microsoft Gold Partner. Um, and we also do a lot of HoloLens stuff these days. So if you're interested in um, augmented reality or 3D or looking like a bit of a tit walking around with a visor on, then come and talk to us, we people. Um, last year, we completed a rewrite of our legacy ASP BB6 and COM Plus application. Um, we moved it to a .NET, software as a service, cloud-based, multi-tenant, insert buzzword here, um, solution, and that's all gone fantastic. And we found a load of new problems that are completely different to the old problems we had, but it's all good fun, including some of the ones I'm going to talk about uh, as we get around. Um, so yeah, let's get on with it. Um, so first of all, apologies. The, we're going to look at some code samples later. They are all in .NET. I'm a .NET developer. I can be bothered to uh, write Python versions or JavaScript versions. So they should hopefully translate into whatever language you're familiar with. Um, however, um, for anyone who's non-technical or less technical in the audience, um, I was trying to think of a metaphor to use here because you've got to have a metaphor. It makes you sound more interesting and like you know what you're talking about. Um, so the best one I could think of um, was the difference between cartoons or comics, if you prefer, and photorealistic paintings or oil paintings, fine art in general. Um, if you think about it, all art is fundamentally abstract. You have a drawing of a pipe. That is a drawing of a pipe. It is not the pipe itself. I promise that's as philosophical as I'm going to get in this talk. Um, but if you think about cartoons, they are extreme examples of that. They are heavily abstracted representations of something in the real world. Take an example, a wonderful example of my artistic talent. That is a circle, a curved line, and two dots. And instantly, you know that's a face. Your brain fills it in for you. I don't have to worry about it. If I want to show you a representation of a face, I draw that. It takes two seconds. Um, as an example, I'm sure most of you know XKCD. Um, Randall Monroe, the artist, uses a very, very simplified style using stick men and you know, very simple line graphics to get his point across. That lets him churn out I think, about three strips a week. Um, importantly, it also lets him concentrate on the story behind that. So he's not concentrating on drawing someone there and drawing every line and bag and the eyes, drawing the hair, clothes and all that. He just wants a stick man there so that you know there's a person there. Um, and again, our brains fill in that detail. It lets him focus on what he actually wants to represent. I'm not saying he doesn't have some visually striking stuff, um, but it's not what he's focused on. In contrast, you've got sort of traditional fine art, probably oil painting. If you've never done oil painting before, it's a fantastic hobby, extremely messy. Don't start it if you've got a small house. But you start off by taking your canvas and prime it. If you get that wrong, you throw the whole thing away. You draw your charcoal sketch on the canvas, and then you put your undercoat on. If you get your undercoat wrong, all the colors in your painting go wrong because they pick up the underlying tone. And as you go through, you layer on, you start with very thin layers, very watered down layers of paint, and you gradually layer heavier and heavier coats on until eventually you're at the top layer. But you need to plan that because you need to know to use your the blues underneath to get the right shadow to contrast the yellows that you're putting on top. If you get it wrong, you end up having to either paint over the whole canvas and start again or throw it out and get a new canvas. 
Um, and it should be pretty obvious by now that I'm making that an analogy for waterfall design. Um, or, in fact, the sort of traditional architecture um, that I'm sure everyone's come across, where you can read that. You've got, um, you've got your database at the bottom, because the database is king. You've got your data access layer that talks to the database. You've got a business logic layer that talks to your data access layer. And you've got a UI layer that talks to your business layer, and hopefully doesn't talk directly to your database in turn. I've seen some apps that do that. Um, which is great and it works. Um, Bill and Claire in the front here will remember um, a system we worked on a couple of clients ago where we were trying to unit test something like this. Well, data access can't do anything without the database. Business logic can't do anything without data access. UI, no one tests the UI, although they say they do. Um, but trying to test just this bit, just the business logic, you have to pull all this through. And actually, our first step in our unit tests back then was to restore the database backup. Um, we actually had an instance where we, uh, one of our clients went bust. This is Woolworths. And they'd been our first client. And we removed the data from our database. And all our unit tests broke because we used their IDs for everything. This is an example of what not to do. This is an example of what dependencies and abstraction can get you away from. So as a contrast, um, I'm sure many of you have seen this before. This is something called the Onion architecture, drawn by a chap called uh, Jeffrey Palermo back in 2008, so it's not, not at all new. The difference here, and to be fair, he's drawn it in a different way, but you could draw the same diagram with a traditional approach. The difference he's got is that your domain model, your elusive beast called business logic, lives at the core. Your dependencies, your data access, your SOAP services, web services, payment services, enterprise service buses, whatever they might be, they sit around that. And your core defines what these things are and how they should behave, but actually it doesn't care how it's implemented. If you've got a legacy BB6 application running behind COM Plus, you just say, there is this service. It will do this if you give it this, and you will get back this. And you write your code around that. You don't care how it's implemented. At least that's the theory. And obviously, with this model, you've got the database way out over here, rather than sat right in the middle, as it traditionally tends to be. Um, now, three years ago, I would have said, this is absolutely the way to do it. This is perfection. Stop right there. Do this. To an extent, I would still agree with that. I still think this is a very good way of architecting your system. I think it has a lot of benefits over the way the older ways that we've, uh, we've perhaps done things. Maybe picked up a few subtleties that this doesn't cover. And hopefully, I'll cover some of those during this talk. Um, because I think one of the things I've found, I'm sure a lot of you have as well, is that you look at the theory behind this, and it seems great. And then you actually open up a file in Visual Studio or Eclipse or whatever, and you go, oh, but that needs to talk to, how do I do this? What happens here? Um, so there's a few things that I found around this um, that perhaps don't quite work as well as it looks on architectural diagrams. Architects love diagrams. So I'm going to take a break from the slides there. Um, and bear with me, because this is usually where things go completely wrong. Um, I'm just going to zoom out to studio. So what I'm going to illustrate here is the journey that I've taken. Um, again, I think it's the journey that the industry as a whole has probably taken over the last two decades. And maybe it's familiar to some of you as well. So we're going to start off, um, because it's easier just to show the code usually, with, you don't say a video, so I can give you the actual slides later. Um, so this is where I pretty much started in development. You've got a class, call it customer for the sake of argument. We'll give it a few properties just to flesh it out. Got a static method to create a customer. So how do we create a customer? Well, we talk to the database, because that's where customers live. So we open an um, ADO.NET connection, SQL connection, issue a SQL command. We build up some SQL. It could be a store procedure. It could be SQL. Don't really care for the purposes of this talk. Um, 
we set some parameters, we execute it, we get the result back. And that works. We've all seen code like that. I've certainly written plenty of code like that. And in that example, it's not too bad. I can show you exactly what happens um, when you continue on that way. So this is um, a method from our legacy system in VB6. Um, and as I scroll down, try and spot the business logic in that. The vast majority of that is simply setting up database queries. And this, you know, for purposes of our conversation, dependencies. And it goes on. This is one method. That was taken from a 4,000 line VB6 file. This is, by the way, not where you want to be. Um, <clears throat> so we move on. We think, how can we make this better? So version two. We think, right, let's move all that logic into a data layer. So again, just chucking all this in one file for clarity. We set up a customer data access object. And we have, we have a little connection string here. This is fantastic, by the way. This couples your business logic to your UI layer. Because if your UI layer isn't configured properly, your business logic breaks. Lovely little gotcha. Um, and we basically move all the data access code that we had before into this object. And then our business object, is nice and simple. Data layer, customer create. Data layer, customer find. Typically it's more complex. You might do, you might have a sign up method that goes check customer name is valid. If not valid, throw exception, send an email out, put them in the database, call out to the ERP system, whatever you do. Um, that's a lot better. Suddenly it's easier to read your code. Um, you've made your life a lot easier. And actually, that works for a lot of people. Stack Overflow is written pretty much like this. If you ever follow um, Nick Craver on Twitter, he posts screenshots of their code. It's this. They don't do any dependency injection. They abstract very little. It's just global data layer, do this stuff. They operate at quite a large scale. They have fairly special needs. Um, however, You've still got the same problem that you had with the first one. Namely, if you want to test that, you need a database. It could be running on your machine, it could be running on a test server, but you need a database or something that ADO.net can connect to. Or in fact, the way it's written, it's got to be SQL Server because I've hard-coded SQL connection. So the last stage, and this is pretty much where we are at some branding at the moment, um, is to introduce some sort of abstraction over that. So we're going to set up an interface, could be an abstract class, um, and we're going to call it iCustomer repository. And we're going to define three methods. I've added another one just because. Find, create, name exists. What typically happens when you do this is that you end up with some sort of manager or service object that consumes that repository um, and then runs, like I was saying earlier, runs some logic it runs your business logic. It uses that dependency um, to get the data it needs to make the decisions that it needs to make. So in this situation, you've now got a class, customer manager, and a sort of fairly bare bones record class called customer, and that represents your business logic. Now in a typical example, your dependencies would be elsewhere. You'd have your interfaces in your core data model layer, or sorry, core um, business layer. You'd implement your SQL code, your WCF client code, HTTP client, whatever it might be, in the outside dependency is dotted around the edge. Um, <clears throat> there are some things with that that, um, that will bite you later, but we'll get onto those in a bit. So, I just, uh, and obviously if you never tried doing this before, the way that you test this is that you can either create a stub class that implements this interface, you can use a mocking framework like MockU you or nmox or Rhino or whatever. Um, and you can just pass it in to customer manager. Then your unit tests can just go, if customer exists, I should return my exception or whatever the, the logic is. Um, so why? What's the benefit of doing that? Meanwhile, I get back to my point. Um, Burned. 
So why do we do this? Testability is the number one reason. I won't tread on all these toes. Um, but that's why we're doing it, so that we can test things, so that we know that when we change things, we haven't broken stuff, or that at least we know what we've broken. Flexibility. Um, if you're writing an application that needs to be installed on a client site, you don't maybe have control over what database it's using, you can swap them out. It's fairly rare, but it is possible. Um, refactoring is easier, like I've just said. Context boundaries. By putting things in an interface that are together, like in this case, data access, you are implicitly drawing a boundary around this thing. You are saying this is how you access customer data, or whatever it might be. Um, if you think back to the first example, or that god-awful VB file that was there briefly, that's scattered everywhere. You don't have a data layer. You don't have a business logic layer. You just have code. It's basically scripts that just do stuff. Um, there's a psychological benefit as well, and that goes along with context boundaries. By saying, this is my I something service, or my something service base, or however your language of choice does it, you are giving the impression this is a separate thing. Your developer is, not, is no longer just connecting to a SQL database. They are calling the SQL database service. And there is a slight benefit to that, especially when you have services that abstract fairly expensive calls. You know, think a call to an old mainframe or a you know, slow query. Um, and fundamentally, the whole point is to make you more agile. You've no longer got this monolith of code that is intertwined with data access and implementation details. You have your logic. You can change your implementations. You can test your implementations. And again, I'm sure Ollie will be talking more about that later on. Um, so there's three styles of abstraction that I've come across. Um, I just want to talk briefly about what they are, what the differences are, and maybe some of the gotchas with doing it. So the first style of abstraction, uh, again, this is one we use at some branding. Um, this is a sort of generic repository. Everyone at some point will end up writing something like this, which is, you know, I've got generics, or there's usually something, objects, or something like that you can use for this. I want to find an object of this type. If I give it an ID, great, I can use that for anything. I can use that for querying anything as well, or I can use that for adding and removing. And actually, I've just abstracted CRUD here. This is great. This is the only abstraction I need. I can pass it to all my classes. I write it once. I implement it using Entity Framework, ADO.Met and Reflection, whatever it might be. Um, architects love this. It means you construct a parameter and now one value. It's nice and neat. It does have some caveats. Um, it's a very leaky abstraction, for example. You are hiding all the features of whatever the implementation is and, and provides to you, which is not always a good thing. Um, you'll probably need to change it if you change the underlying provider. You want to change from Entity Framework to RavenDB or Hibernate to Mongo, I will bet you you will need to change this in some regard. Um, and make it harder to enforce bounded context. You now have one generic repository that everything can talk to, which means everything can talk to everything in your database. There are ways around that. But I have seen it make code more tangled than it should be. Um, surprisingly hard to mock this. Uh, you end up having to write a class that basically implements this that is worth unit testing in its own right. Here's a tip. If you are writing a class to support your unit tests that in turn needs its own unit tests, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, hands up, we have done that. Uh, great. Um, so there's another style, which is the sort of the query encapsulation. So rather than that, you think, right, we'll take it back to basics. We want an interface that says, I have a query, which might be a store procedure or a service call that gets, that does find me a customer. Or get customer, this is by name, get customers by minimum spend or whatever your business rules and your queries are. Um, that's very easy to mock. It's very easy to stub out because you just say, when I call this method, I want to return these objects and you test against it. Um, I find this very good for working against Something like um, something that's quite arcane. If you're talking to a 
COBOL mainframe sat in the basement. You have one programmer who knows how that works. He is the only programmer who needs to touch that. You write an interface, and you do not go beyond that. You know that if you call this, it will work. Um, it's also broadly how SOAP works, if you think about contracts and implementations. Um, the con, of course, is that you've got to write this for everything. Every query you write that you want to use, you need to put a method in your interface to call it. Um, not everyone's cup of tea. Some people go, oh, that seems like a lot of work and a lot of smoke and mirrors, um, which is fair enough. I tend to prefer this style these days, but again, um, there's pros and cons to, to all of these. The last one um, is something I've been doing a lot more of recently, and it's kind of going a bit more back to basics. It's a sort of, I couldn't think of a good name for it, so I called it mixed. Um, ADO.net um, is already an abstraction. It already provides a way of plugging in providers under the cover. The philosophy behind doing something like this is that if you're going to take a dependency on a library, be it ADO.net, Hibernate, Raven, Mongo, whatever, take that dependency and use it. Use it properly, use all the features it provides, but find some way of just plugging in that little kernel that you need. And in this case, it's just that database connection. That's an interface like any other, and I can mock that. There are libraries out there that do it, or I can write my own. Other libraries like, for example, Raven has an embedded in memory mode. Mongo has the same. You could use SQLite, and there's, there are as many ways to do it as there are libraries around. Um, now, you still end up calling your underlying framework. So if you look at the implementation, we're still using ADO.net, very old fashioned. Um, but actually, uh, we can still abstract that into a data access object, and we can still inject into our data access object. The sort of example of ways I've been using this recently are for the smaller projects we're doing at Sun Branding. Um, we're using Entity Framework as the ORM, and we just use that in our core library. And especially with um, Entity Framework core that's now coming out, you can just plug your provider straight into that. And there's an in-memory provider that will basically simulate a database um, on your machine. So for unit testing, it's just there. Um, that's actually proved quite nice. I have very, very rarely switched the underlying framework of an application without a full rewrite. Um, and to be honest, even if you do, it's a weekend worth of typing, which you're going to have to do even with your abstractions. And if you've got an abstraction over it, it's probably going to be more work because you're now fighting with your abstraction on top of another abstraction, on top of probably a third abstraction, and eventually down to the thing that you're actually calling. Um, so this is a pattern I quite like. Um, I just want to put one slide up here. And we're back to code again, and then um, yeah. um, pitfalls abstraction. Um, there's a chap called Allende Rahin. Um, he wrote Raven DB, which I'm a big fan of. Um, and he has this blog post, but if you Google Allende Rahin, Pit of Doom, you'll find it. Um, where he basically rants about this abstraction of repositories. And as he put it, the repository pattern was established at a time when the newest thing on the block was raw SQL calls. And we've kind of moved beyond that now. We have ORMs. We have you know, underlying framework abstractions that we use. And his point is that putting an abstraction on top of that is just weird. You know, you've got something that already abstracts calling SQL and mapping it to objects. Or you've got something that abstracts making a raw TCP IP call to a REST service. Actually putting something on top of that generally just makes it weird. And usually the, th the underlying framework that you're using has a way to fake that anyway, or to inject it or to configure it in a way that you can actually use to test against. Um, so just before we go to questions, uh, I just wanted to go back code and show you a couple of um, pitfalls. So we're going back to something like a, a generic repository. I've just quickly done a iQueryable there. So we've got our repository here. 
and it lets you query objects of type T. Um, we create a couple of objects here. So we've got a customer and an account manager that are related by this ID. Um, now, if we go down to the implementation, this does actually cause us a couple of problems. Our abstraction doesn't give us any access to the underlying ORM. And again, this could be in Hibernate, Hibernate or Entity Framework. It's, it's all the same thing. Um, I can query that, that database and get a customer out. But Entity Framework gives me a async overload to that, which will possibly help my throughput. I can't use that because that's specific to my underlying provider. And because I'm using a generic repository on top of that, um, I can't get to that unless I add a dependency in my front end to the underlying framework, which my middle tier doesn't have, but the, um, the implementation tier does, which is crazy. Um, and also, Entity Framework and Hibernate have ways to get related data. Well, again, I can't do that. I would have to introduce more abstractions um, to basically, I'd basically be re-implementing the interface of Entity Framework in this case to get that level of functionality. Um, so I end up doing two queries, uh, which, again, it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, but it's not the most efficient thing either, and it gets more inefficient um, as you start to want to build up specific data transfer objects or view models um, out of bits of data that you take from various sources. Stuff that's easy if you're doing a raw database SQL call, you can just select whatever columns you like. When you move to this sort of generic repository layer, suddenly you've got to think a bit more, ironically. Um, the alternative way of doing that if you move to a more sort of mixed method, is simply take the dependency, in this case, on, um, on Entity Framework, DB Context, for those of you who don't know, is the Entity Framework um, data access layer. And you extend that to do your uh, functionality. I haven't put it in here, but if I was using EF Core, I could simply inject an in-memory repository there and test against that just as easily, or a SQL like one, or you know, whatever I wanted to use. And if we go down to the actual functionality there, illustration, I've created a little data transfer object, a little info object that's got customer id name and account manager name. So now if I go into my demo, well, I can run that as one query because I can use include, which is a ORM feature. I can project that and I can use the async overload. And I made one database call, I've made it async, I can still test against it, I can still inject into it. Hope's a good one. Um, and that is pretty much me. Thank you very much. Anyone have any questions? Bang on. <laughs>